We begin a, with a four news now special report. What our community needs to see. Tonight, for the first time ever with this kind of access, our cameras go inside the ICU at Sacred Heart Medical Center, where caregivers are battling a pandemic and trying to save lives. Good evening, I'm Nia Wong. And I'm Aaron Luna. For those unsure about how serious COVID is in our community, it's time to see with your own eyes. It's a story we never thought we'd be able to tell. If you'd asked me to do this two years ago, I would have said, oh my gosh, we would never let cameras in our critical care units. But as you said, we're in different times. We are in unprecedented times. Tonight, seeing is believing as our cameras visited the ICU for a snapshot in time so we can show you what's happening in real time. Before we go inside the ICU, we want you to know a couple of things. First, we did not go inside patient rooms. Our staff was masked up and did not interfere with patient care. And Providence screened all of our video before it aired, not to change content or messaging, but to assure that no private patient information is shared. Knowing all that, here's Robin Nance. Well, we, like other news agencies, have been asking for this kind of access since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think the medical community has just had enough. The doctors, the nurses, the entire hospital staff are desperate for everyone, especially those who aren't taking COVID seriously, to understand just how dire it is, particularly in the ICU. Photojournalist Brian Belanger and I were allowed inside for a few hours, and here is what we saw. No chest tubes, is that right? Art lines undone. We arrived just before 11 in the morning and started recording. All right, I'm gonna go in. This team of nurses and a respiratory therapist make up the prone team. At 11 o'clock, they get started. That's right over here. It's their job to turn COVID patients onto their stomachs. These patients are unconscious, on ventilators, unable to breathe on their own. They are completely helpless. I think easiest way to flip her is going to be to bring her up towards me and then flip her onto her stomach towards the vent. That'll take care of the lines. And so what we're trying to do by proning someone is recruit those of Eli to be able to auction eat better and just kind of open things up as much as possible. So. I got this if you want to get the top. You let us know when. Okay, one, two, three. Before everyone leaves, we'll have to get her on pillows. We're not going to be able to sling her, of course, because we have no supplies. You saw an entire team of specialists flip a patient onto their stomach to help them breathe. That's something that hadn't been done before, maybe four or five times a year. Since COVID, it's happening multiple times a day. Back the other way. It was nurse Hannah Rothstrom's voice you were hearing, directing the prone team. It's incredibly labor intensive. Uh, they stay prone for about 16 hours, so she'll stay in that position for 16 hours, um, unprone for the, the rest of the eight, um, and then do it again. It takes this team 20 minutes to get the patient in the proper position. Once she's stable, they strip off their gear, sanitize, go to another patient, and start all over again. You know, and, and it's really your, your last ditch effort to try to save someone's life. Okay, so first we're going to go up to this corner, and then we're going to go up on this side, and then on his belly, ending up facing this way. Right outside this room, a hospital bed is wheeled down the hall. Sure, so we just brought a woman in her early 70s up from the emergency room. She had been waiting in the emergency room for 16 hours, and because we didn't have a bed available, we just now got her up and she has to be emergently intubated, meaning they're going to put in a breathing tube to help her breathe. Deb Gillette has been a nurse for nine years and is the ICU nurse manager. For the past 18 months, she's led a team through the unimaginable. So we have 54 beds for adult critical care at Sacred Heart. 26 are in our general medical neurotrauma ICU, and 28 are in our cardiac ICU. But we have had to use the cardiac ICU beds also for COVID patients. These are the sickest of COVID patients, their bodies shutting down. There are two other floors at Sacred Heart dedicated to COVID patients who are not this sick and not needing ventilators. And some of these rooms were already ready with ventilators, but you had to create rooms or makeshift rooms. Sure. So some, all of our beds have capability to have ventilators in them. 
but we only had four negative airflow rooms, and so we used those special isolation rooms to um, prevent those infectious agents from spreading. Special fans and HEPA filters used in negative airflow rooms act as a vacuum, not allowing potential contaminated air from leaving the room. You can hear the suction when the doors open. If more patients need the negative flow rooms, the hospital may have to reconfigure certain wings of the hospital and bring in equipment it doesn't currently have. We reached a point, I believe it was two weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, we had one bed left on the entire second floor that was a negative airflow. Now upstairs on some of our medical floors, we have patients that would have met ICU criteria weeks ago, right? They're maxed out on the settings and all that they can do upstairs. They would have been brought down already. So then you reach a very difficult decision, right? Who comes down? Who gets the bed? When and why, right? We also reached a situation where we were left to one ventilator in the hospital. So then again, who gets the vent, right? Who makes those difficult decisions? A group of providers. Jeremy says he's just glad he isn't one of them. Keeping these rooms and this unit staffed is Deb's job. She's working with caregivers who are pushed to their limits more than ever. Today we were short maybe nine critical care nurses to start. We had staff here for 16 hours. They are exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally. It's very draining. And we just want to feel like it could get better. You can hear that exhaustion and frustration in the voices of these nurses. Jeremy Malavy. Seems like in the community, people are still not believing that this is real. Uh, we see people die all the time here. Emily Cruz. Ah, uh, it's hard. I mean, it, it makes you sad. It makes you mad. But sometimes it makes you just feel numb. And Eric Definitely. Custer. That's, that's really hard when you're doing a Zoom meeting with 15 people and they're watching their loved one pass away. These three love their jobs as ICU nurses, but are starting to lose hope. Statistics are horrible. You know, if you're intubated with COVID, your chances of survival are very, very small. And the young people, the people with families, with lives like my own, who went to work every day and are never going to go home to their kids, their moms, and their dogs. And just knowing that you did everything and it wasn't enough. And then at the end of the day, you zip up the bag and you have to go home and try to pretend life's okay. Life is not okay for those working tirelessly, short-staffed, dealing with so much loss. Yes, I came home absolutely exhausted. My wife's asking me as I'm trying to fall asleep how my day was, right? Uh, and that's why I honestly just broke down a little bit and just relayed to her how the end of my day was. Ended my day putting two patients in body bags, right? And the family of one of these patients still didn't believe that this was real. Remember early on in the pandemic when the community rallied around first responders, treating them as heroes? It's a much different situation today. I think that it was well intended, but it ended up creating this sort of, these are heroes, nurses signed up for this, they wanna be heroes, and it kind of diminishes the fact that we're all just human. And I'd like to, the same as anyone else in the world, go to my job and then go home. Going home, finding peace, our nurses try to release the pain of the job. You're there for families at the hardest point, you know? And, and so you're that bridge for them to either get to say goodbye to their loved ones or be a part of that. And uh, it's, it's an honor, it's a blessing, uh, and it's, and it's heart-wrenching, all rolled into one. It makes you go home and grab your kids that much tighter. Tell your wife you love her that much more. Um, enjoy ice cream. As each of these nurses tries to grapple with what goes on inside the ICU, they also have different feelings about what happens outside these walls, outside the hospital. Biggest part of that frustration is people not following the science, right? Not believing in the medical community is actually trying our best to give these patients a fighting chance. We're really trying here and the best thing our community can do is get vaccinated. We really have nothing else. That's kind of our, that's our only solution. And the more that people do that, the less time we'll spend in here and the less time I'll spend at home thinking about these people who are never gonna go home. Uh, I'm here to help you in the hardest moments of your life. 
That's what I'm here for. And everything that's happened before then is on you, really. The vaccine is our hope. The more people that get vaccinated, the less patients that we have in the hospital. We spent three hours in the ICU, a snapshot in time, really, as compassionate professionals were doing everything they could to save lives. And as our camera was rolling... Uh, the vast majority of our patients today are in their 30s to 60s. Hey, there is hope. <laughs> there is. We just had a... The chimes are going off. We just had a baby born. A true testament to what happens on a daily basis in our hospitals. Death and life. And when we were in the ICU last Tuesday, there were 17 COVID patients in the ICU being treated there. As of today, we just got this, uh, these numbers. Three of them have improved and were transferred to medical units. Two have been extubated, um, but they are still in the ICU. Um, that means taken off the ventilators. Um, nine remain intubated in the ICU and three have died. That's our that's that's hard reality. to hear. That's yeah. reality. As a journalist, Robin, you are immersed in this story. You've covered the numbers. You hear reports from reporters on scene talking to doctors. Yeah. But how has this changed your perspective going in there yourself? As we've been saying, seeing is believing. And you want to believe the things that you're being told by professionals and, and, and the people who have the numbers. But when you see what goes on there for yourself with your own eyes, it changes it just, everything is so real now. Mm -hmm. And it really was to me before, but, but seeing and then talking to the, the nurses who were just so, you felt it. It's moving. Overloaded, yeah. 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 And we've been getting so much response to so this story. Much. Yeah, yeah, even before it aired. But I will say, um, most interestingly, just a couple of hours ago, I received an email from Jeremy, the nurse who you saw in the story. He's trying to reach a former patient. A woman and her mother both came in with COVID recently, very, very sick. Both were intubated. After some time, the daughter improved, was moved to another unit, then was later released. But her mom did not survive. And her last words to Jeremy were, tell my daughter that I love her. He was not able to do that. It is weighing so heavily on him. He just wants the daughter to know what her mother said. So hopefully, if you've seen this or you know the family, you can help sh spread the word and um, get those to get that message to the daughter. Wow, yeah. very powerful. And we have even more coverage of Robin's time inside the ICU. Just head over to kxly.com slash inside dash the dash ICU where you can see photo galleries and so much more.